It's another episode of Zylog and Moto. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's terrible. But there's also a very good chance I'm going to reuse that when it's time to review this game's sequel on down the line. And, oh, by the way, that game wasn't released in the United States either. Yay for crappy imports! What is Back to the Future 2? And what happened to Back to the Future Part 1? Well, if you don't know what the Back to the Future movies are, I'm just going to come out and say it. I feel sorry for you. And this is coming from a random dork on YouTube channel that no one watches, so really, go take a long, hard look in the mirror and then go watch the entire trilogy of movies. I'll wait. Okay, that should be long enough. To sum up for all the other viewers, the Back to the Future trilogy comprises three movies released between 1985 and 1990, starring Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly, a hot-headed teenager, and Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown, a mad scientist who Marty befriends, and that manages to make a time machine out of a DeLorean. And if you don't know what a DeLorean is, well, stop making me feel old, alright? Fox and Lloyd have proven to have great chemistry together, and the whimsical first movie was so successful, Universal Studios would go on to greenlight back-to-back -back sequels, something relatively unheard of at the time, with Back to the Future 2 releasing in November of 1989, and Back to the Future 3 six months later in May 1990. The movies were so successful, they were of course ripe for video game ports. However, with the original Back to the Future appearing in 1985, it was a bit passe by the time the 8-bit console generation hit its stride, and as such only made an appearance on the NES not counting a separate game released on various European home computers. Now that all that is out of the way, let's talk about what Back to the Future 2, developed and published by Imageworks in 1991, is, and what it's not. If you're an American, you probably only remember one video game based on Back to the Future 2, and that was Back to the Future 2 and 3, released for the NES in 1990. I've never played that game, and I certainly don't ever plan on playing it, because I've heard it's all kinds of awful. However, that game was made by LGN and thankfully has nothing to do with the game we're talking about today. Instead, as stated before, today's game was created by Imageworks, a British publisher. However, this version of Back to the Future 2 wasn't just created for the Master System. Ports of the game were also made for the Amiga, Atari ST, Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC, ZX Spectrum, and finally DOS. And as was normal at the time for games were ported to the various European home computers, there is a wide difference between, say, the Amiga version, which as far as I can tell is the definitive version, and either the Amstrad or ZX versions. But all of these games are definitely at least versions of the same game, for better or worse, with the Master System version falling somewhere in the middle. Does a port landing in the middle make for a good game? And does the game do justice to the original source material of the classic movie? And should you seek out for your Master System collection, knowing that unless you live in Europe, you'll have be having to have it shipped from overseas? Well, we'll get to all that. But to give you a hint, I was about as impressed with this game as the kids in the diner were when Marty showed them how to play Wild Gunman. But let's get into it and take a look at the package. And here is Back to the Future Part 2, and you can immediately see that the cover isn't in the greatest condition. More on that in a minute. Aside from that, since this was a late 1991 release, it's got a more modern, for the Master System anyway, cover. that has the logo from the movie complete with a flying DeLorean. As you can see here. And if you didn't know earlier and didn't watch the movies like I told you to, a DeLorean is a short-lived American car built in the mid-80s to look cool, futuristic, and fast, but in reality, well, let's just say you had to be there. Uh, while this is a third-party game, as you can see from the Imageworks logo in the corner, and on the spine, there at the top, It still retains the look of a standard Master System title, not unlike how James Buster Douglas Knockout Boxing last week was a Taito title, but still resembled a regular first party Genesis title. This was more common on the Master System, having third party releases still keep the same overall graphical format, and I can't decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing. However, I do think it's a bit odd having Sega 
right in the middle at the top and I don't know just the whole feng shui so to speak of the graphic design on this cover just seems off and probably could have been arranged better flipping over to the back and you can see a little bit more staining down there at the bottom uh, but thankfully most of the damage was on the front cover uh, no idea what caused any of that my guess is some coffee or tea spilled and just managed to get inside the outer protective cover a bit uh, you can tell this is a European edition due to the inclusion of the six languages on the back Uh, and to be clear, this game was only released in Europe, Australia, and Brazil in, in October of 1991. The Master System was dead everywhere else. Uh, along with the multi-language flavor text, there's also four not-so-great screenshots of the game. Uh... This game doesn't exactly look that great to begin with, uh, especially for a late 1991 release, but these poor screenshots pretty much put the nail in the coffin for anyone that needs a graphical examples to make a purchase. Just a uh, yuck. You know, I'll give you a close-up of some of these. Just a uh, not great quality. They, they definitely could have been captured better. Uh, however, fun note, if you look close, I'm going to assume you can't see this on the video. Let me try to get one of these really close in here. Uh, you can see, well, maybe you can see, I'm not sure if you can. Um, the scores in the middle of the screen all end in a 1 or 9. And in the actual game, those would always be zeros. Uh, so this must have been some sort of beta pre-release pre-release version of the game that they took these screenshots from. Uh, I feel sure they never expected anyone to look that close. Uh, other than the discoloration on the inner cover, like especially here, I didn't really highlight that too much, and there's a there's a tiny bit up here at the top as well. Uh, the rest of the case is in decent shape. Um, there is a slight puncture right here, but other than that, uh, it's it, you know it's intact uh, except for the uh, hang tab being removed at the top as it is so often. Um, uh, but I was able to clean up the rest of the front and back with some alcohol and at least make it somewhat presentable. Uh, opening the box up, you see a red label cartridge. Uh, albeit with the name in a bit of an odd font. I can give you a close-up of that. It definitely does not look like your standard one. And a small ImageWorks uh, tag there. Um, however, the manual is a bit different than some of the other Euro ones we've looked at before. Um, in the past, you know, in, in, instead of having uh, each language split up on the page where you'd have like language, 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 and it was spread throughout the manual, instead it actually does this in more of a sensical way and has the various languages split into spots in the manual. So it actually goes to languages one at a time. Um, I also don't know why Sega ever used the other format, unless it was just to, you know, somehow try to make everyone think their language was equal. Um, anyway, format aside, uh, the manual is decent and does provide uh, the nice backstory to the uh, game here at the beginning. You see the story so far there, uh, if you hadn't seen the movies. And it also explains each of the four mission types. So there, mission one, mission two, and so on uh, in the game. And provides a brief section about mission five, which is fundamentally the same as the first one. Um, the all blue screenshots, 
see here it's a little hard to make out what's going on um, they don't help to make the game look any better but they are better than just having a bunch of text okay that's what the game physically looks like now let's break down the game itself so I mentioned last week in the closing section of the Buster Douglas video that this game wasn't going to be very good. However, I was just being facetious, and I didn't really know if the game was going to be good or not at the time. I hadn't even looked at any screenshots of the game, much less played it. It could have been a hidden gem for all I knew, and I really did go into this with an open mind. Boy, that changed quick. But that's getting ahead of myself a bit. Let me go back for a second. Back to the Future 2 is a multi-platform action game at its core, despite the arcade label that's emblazoned on the front cover. Not sure why Sega lumped it in with the arcade category, when the action category exists, and it's not an arcade port, but honestly, that's par for the course with as sloppy as the rest of the game is. However, even the action category isn't a great fit, due to the game having an eccentric level structure that would make even Doc Brown proud. Let me explain. The game is made up of five levels total. Of the five levels, only the first and last have a similar structure. I read online someone compared the game to a poor Paperboy ripoff, and I can kind of see that, specifically in those two levels, but certainly not the whole game. The first level, which takes place in the year 2015, and the last level, which takes place in 1955, both follow Marty as he uses a hoverboard to try to make his way through the level. During the level, you either be moving horizontally, either left to right or right to left, depending on the section, or diagonally towards the upper right-hand corner of the screen, which is where the paperboy comparison comes in, I guess. Sounds relatively straightforward, right? Well, if it was straightforward, this would be a completely different conversation. No, there's some significant issues here. The first problem is that one-hit kills exist. Now, Granted, lots of games have one-hit kills. However, Back to the Future 2 also has normal attacks as well, and Marty has a life bar that can be replenished by collecting items during the level. So, what gives? Well, apparently, if Marty hits certain enemies, dogs, robots, cars, some people, that's enough to knock him off his hoverboard and kill him straight away, and he's going to have to go back to the beginning of the section of the level he's in. Level 1 and Level 5 both have seven sections to navigate. But other times, the other hoverboarders instead fight with Marty rather than killing him right away, and the only way to know which is which is to have played through the level before. Also, most of those, we'll say kamikaze skaters, attack quick, so you really have to know the levels well and be prepared for them to appear on the screen and be ready to avoid them right away. And honestly, this goes for everything you have to avoid. You better learn where the dogs are, where the robots are, and most importantly, when cars are going to cross and where, or else you don't stand a chance. But, I also stated that some of the skaters you fight with as well, rather than just avoid, right? Well, you can try to fight with them. And, of the two buttons on the controller, in these levels, one is for jumping and the other is for attacking, so you'd think the designers would expect you to do so. However, there's no rhyme or reason to the fighting. Even when you're standing still right next to an enemy, hammering on the attack button, there's no guarantee you're going to hit them. And it doesn't seem like you have to hit the enemies a certain number of times, it just seems like you have to hit them just right. While in the meantime, they're attacking you, whittling your health bar down and dying again. In the end, except for certain situations, you're always better off avoiding everything and hoping that something doesn't come out of nowhere, or seemingly nowhere due to flickering, and wiping you out. All of this in and of itself wouldn't be that big a deal. I mean, this was the 8-bit era, and some of the games from those days are legendary for their difficulty. And playing these two levels does have a strange, perverse charm to it, as you push yourself to try to complete that least that one level. However, there's two other problems I haven't mentioned yet. The hit detection in the game is not great. You can be moving through the level, see an enemy and think, oh, there's an enemy there, I should avoid them. And think you did exactly that, but no, one hit kill, back to the beginning of the section. You learn pretty quick to give everything in the game a wide berth, 
and still at times you find yourself accidentally hitting something that should have been totally avoidable. The second problem is the controls themselves. Moving around the screen works about as well as you'd expect in the horizontal sections. In the diagonal paperboy sections? Not so much. Somehow you gain the ability to move backwards faster than normal in these areas, so oftentimes you'll have moved past an enemy, think that you're in the clear, move back to avoid an enemy ahead of you, only to go slamming back into that enemy you thought you'd gotten past and dying on the spot. Moving left and right in these sections is awkward as well. You'll get used to it, but it's definitely not as straightforward as you would expect. If you're able to finally make it past the first level, you'll then get to the second level, which is a weird top-down logic minigame when you're trying to get your girlfriend, Jennifer, out of a house unseen. Then the third level is a very simple 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up level, where you can jump, punch, or duck and kick enemies, all while being invincible to throwing barrels, in what has to be either a glitch or an alteration to make the game easier. The fourth level changes things again, with a sliding tile puzzle of Marty playing Johnny B. Good, before switching back to the original format for level 5. I just... I... don't... understand any of it. I guess they couldn't come up with a single concept that fit the entire movie, but this totally feels like they gave each level to a different programmer, told all of them, go do something, and this is what they came back with. I did manage to finally beat the game, but not honestly, because the cars you have to avoid in level 5 are ridiculous. Turns out, there's a glitch in level 2 and level 4 where they're considered bonus levels, so even if you don't pass the level, you don't get a game over either fail one of those two levels when you only have one life, and then instead of having zero lives, you have infinite lives. This is a fantastic glitch, but it's still a glitch, and is just emblematic of how poorly designed the game is. Also, just as a further kick in the nuts, there's no ending. Upon beating the game, you get a to be continued in Back to the Future 3 screen, and that's it. No credits, no nothing. I can only imagine if I had practiced and memorized the levels well enough to beat the game honestly, only to get that ending. Just shameful, really. As you might imagine, the way I've talked about the gameplay and the fairly weak structure of the game, the graphics and sound aren't anything to write home about either. I looked at video of the other versions of the game, specifically the Amiga and Atari ST versions, and it's a night and day difference. Now, those are both 16-bit computers, more on par with the Genesis, so I wouldn't expect the Master System graphics to match up with them, but it's not even close. And if I was showing screenshots from different sections of the game without being familiar with it, I'm not even sure if I would know they were the same game. The most damning thing I can say about the in-game graphics is that while the cutscene and level 4 graphics look pretty nice, the rest looks like a mediocre NES game. The last Master System game I looked at on Xylogamoto, which was Wonder Boy back in episode 51, looked better than this game, and it came out five years earlier in 1986. The in-game sound isn't much better. Alan Silvestri's Back to the Future theme is included in the game, in a butchered fashion, but I guess you can at least tell what it is. That's not much consolation for your 50th time hearing it because you keep dying on the first level, however. Each of the levels do have their own background music, including a jaunty attempt at Johnny B. Good to go along with the on-screen puzzle during level 4, but none of it's worth writing home about. The music is similar to the game's graphics, incredibly mediocre and passe by 1991 standards. The sound effects are okay, but there's just not very many of them, and during levels 2 and 3, when the background music is more subdued, the game gets relatively quiet. It's not what you want in an action game. Back to the Future 2, and in fact the entire Back to the Future series, is pretty universally beloved, spawning other games, a cartoon series, and a ride at the Universal Studios. How it's pretty much the only reason why anyone in 2020 knows what a DeLorean is, and filmmaker Robert Zemeckis feels so strongly about the series that he's publicly stated he'll block any attempt to remake or reboot the series as long as he's capable. It's unfortunate that the majority of the video games to go along with the series were so bad until the recent Telltale Adventure series. 
and this game definitely belongs to the majority in that case. All in all, I'm giving Back to the Future 2 on the Master System 1 star out of 5. The only thing keeping this from being a complete bomb is that I can at least see a decent idea for a game here. It's just that the execution was simply terrible. And it is beatable via the Infinite Lives bug. But boy, when I finished playing through the game a second time to record the in-game video, I let out a sigh of relief that I would never have to play this game again. Okay, that was Back to the Future 2, a game that we should probably be thanking Imageworks for not attempting to port to the United States. I know developers in the 8-bit era were handcuffed by only being able to do so much with the hardware they were given, but a game can be primitive and still fun if it's designed correctly, and this simply wasn't. And the worst part is, I'm sure as soon as Imageworks finished this game, they moved on to create Back to the Future 3 as well which is looming in my future as unpleasantly as a scheduled root canal. Oh yes, we'll get to it eventually, and it's somewhat rare Genesis Brother as well that did get released in the United States. Tune in next week when I review... something, that I hope the good lord isn't a crappy game. I'll even take mediocre, but two one-star games in a row is rough. I think I've got a good idea though, maybe get back into the shooter genre with a classic from Capcom that I haven't played in 30 years. Yeah, yeah, I'm liking this. Remember, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later.